This morning we're beginning a new sermon series that will take us to the end of July and the start of our new normal. That time when we reopen and relaunch our ministries, when we take that bold step of faith to once again become a neighborhood church for Northeast Birmingham. And more to the point, when we become a healthy neighborhood church for Northeast Birmingham. A healthy church. Healthy churches have healthy members. And so over the next two months, we're going to look at what makes a healthy church member. We're going to look at eight commitments that you and I need to make in order to be healthy. And that's what I'm hoping that at the end of this eight weeks, that you will join me in making these commitments. I will worship. I will grow. I will serve. I will go. I will give. I will participate. I will connect with others. Now, if you were counting, you realize that I only mentioned seven commitments. And for some of you, that's bothering you. (laughs) Because I said there were eight, and I only mentioned seven. And there's a reason for that. All seven of those are things that you would have expected me to say that a healthy church member would do those seven things. Those are are actions that we know that just kind of go along with being a church member. I will worship. I will grow. I will serve. I will go. I will give. I will participate, and I will connect with others. And all seven of those are unbelievably, incredibly important. But without the eighth commitment, none of the other seven matter. And so this morning, we are going to begin with that eighth commitment. We're going to actually make it our first commitment, and it is this. I will love. I will love. Our text this morning is going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Where else would you go to preach on love, right? I will love. Now those of you who are in Bible studies for life, you've already gotten a a primer on this this morning because you are looking at Revelation chapters 1 through 3 and I'm going to test how much you were actually listening. You remember when Jesus wrote the letter to the church at Ephesus? He had one thing against them. Do you remember what it was? Do you? They had left their first love. And interestingly enough, Jesus commended them for all of the great things that they were doing. In fact, if they had been going off of the same list that we were, they would have been able to check off every box. They were, they were worshiping, they were, they were growing, they were giving, they were serving, they were, go, they, they were doing all of those things. And from somebody looking on the outside in, they appeared to be a happening church. What I call the First Baptist Church of what's happening now. And so from the outside, that's the way it looked. But on the inside, they were missing something that made everything else of no consequence. They had left their first love. So they were just going through the motions. Because they had lost their love for God and their love for people. See, church, you can do all of the right things for all of the wrong reasons. That's why Paul wrote the letter to the Corinthians. They were doing a lot of right things, but they were doing a lot of things for the wrong reasons. And in fact, if you want to if you want to just think about the most dysfunctional church that may have ever existed, it was the church at Corinth. They had problems, their problems had problems. I mean, it was just a hot mess of a church. And so Paul in chapter 13 gets to the very heart of the matter. I'm going to read the first four verses where Paul speaks these familiar words. He said, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, 
I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. A healthy church is motivated by love. Love for Jesus and love for people. Now, think about this. What, what he is saying in those first three verses, he says, you know what? Without love, your worship is like fingernails on a chalkboard. We're all old enough to remember chalkboards. See, if we were in a millennial church, I couldn't use that illustration because everybody would go, what's a chalkboard? But we understand chalkboards, and we all remember those times where the teacher would scrape her fingernails on the chalkboard to get our attention, or maybe that was just in my class that that happened. Without love, our worship is noise. Our preaching is meaningless. Without love, our giving can be self-seeking. That was the problem in Corinth. Fifty years later, it was the problem in Ephesus, and I wonder, is it not a problem in the 21st century American church today? Without love. Are we motivated by love? Or are we motivated by something else? Are we motivated by dutiful obligation? Do you get up and come to church on Sundays because you feel obligated to do so? Or do you come because you cannot wait to be with God, the God that you love and the people that you love? What about your giving? Do you give to bless the God that you love? Or do you give because you're supposed to? What about your service? Are you motivated by reluctant service? Well, somebody's got to do it. I don't really want to do it. I'm not really excited about doing it. I'm not happy about it, but somebody's got to do it, so I guess it will be me. Now look, those of us in vocational ministry, we are not beyond using guilt to get you into that kind of service. I mean, a spot's got to be filled, a spot's got to be filled. But the truth of the matter is, what is our motivation? Are we doing it because no one else will do it? Or are we doing it because we love Jesus that much? Are you motivated by the repetitive routine? Do you find yourself just singing the words on Sunday mornings? Some of you are going, no, I don't find myself singing the words on Sunday mornings because I don't know the words on Sunday mornings. But in those songs that we do know by heart, do we find ourselves just kind of singing the words without really thinking about what we're doing? Or does our heart fly before the throne of God when we worship? See, if my heart flies before the throne of God when I worship, I don't even have to know the words. I'm just so thrilled to be in His presence. Is all of this just so much a part of your life that you go through the motions, falling into a rut? By the way, you know what a rut is, right? A rut is a grave with the ends kicked out. That's all it is. Are we motivated by something else? I've known church members before who were motivated by making themselves look good. Whatever they did, they wanted people to notice them. They they were motivated by something that was selfish. But Paul said, without love, nothing else matters. In fact, you remember Jesus' words when he was asked about the greatest commandment. He said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself and then he went on to define what he meant by neighbor your neighbor is everyone because in Christ there is no male or female in Christ there is no Jew nor Greek there are no social barriers there is no racial divide no one person is greater or lesser 
than any other. And in fact, the scripture teaches us that if you can't love people, you can't really say that you love God. Amen. They go together. Healthy churches are made up of healthy church members. And healthy church members are loving church members. They worship and grow and give and go because they love God and because they love people. That is the motivation. It's love. And love is supreme. I'm reminded of the old hymn that includes these words, of the themes that men have known, one supremely stands alone. Through the ages it has shown, tis his wonderful, wonderful love. Y'all know the chorus, right? Would you join me in singing it? Love is the theme, love is supreme, sweeter it grows, glory bestows, bright as the sun, ever it glows. Love is the theme, eternal theme. Every time I hear that song, I think about my grandmother. It's, it was one of her favorite hymns. But it's also a wonderful description of the overarching, overriding theme of all of Scripture. Amen. The message of the gospel is love. Jesus said it like this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Paul put it like this, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the motive behind all of God's activity in the world is sacrificial love. God acts lovingly toward us, and in return, he requires that we act lovingly toward him and toward each other. It's what it means when he said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. Amen. That is our response to his sacrificial love. Jesus summarized the Old Testament law again by saying, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I love the little book of 1 John toward the end of the New Testament. We believe written by the same apostle that wrote the Gospel of John and also the apostle who, to whom Jesus gave the revelation. And in 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, this is what he says to the early church. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning that you should love one another. Interesting little note here. More than likely, we believe that John was writing that specifically to the church at Ephesus. And so they were already beginning to slip in their love. And John is having to remind them that that message that they've heard from the very beginning is that they should love one another. So then the question flows, if we're supposed to love one another, how exactly do we do that? Well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning in verse 4, our love for each other is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, if, if you just kind of take a step back from those words, and you think about who has shown that kind of love. 
Now, you may be thinking about somebody that's very dear in your life, and they exemplify that kind of love. But the reality is this. These verses give us a very clear picture of the way in which Christ has loved us. The way he has sacrificially loved us. He loves us with a love that is incredibly patient. In fact, in 1 Peter it says that God is patient, not willing to, He is slow, he is patient, he is waiting on us because he is not willing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. So so God is patient with us. He pleads, he urges, he takes us where we are and he patiently leads us forward. Jesus loves us with a love that brings contentment, satisfaction, peace. So there's no need for jealousy, no need for envy, just that satisfaction that comes from knowing that we are in a right relationship with him. Jesus loves us with a love that brings humility. No arrogance, no bragging, no pushing for position, for power, or for prestige. It does not act unbecomingly, it is not rude, it gives people the benefit of the doubt. Oh, how it would be if we could just give people the benefit of the doubt we want it for ourselves I mean I want you to give me the benefit of the doubt oh how it would be if we were all that way toward one another Jesus loves us with a love that is forgiving it's not irritable it's not resentful it doesn't keep a record of wrongs it follows the golden rule he loves us with a love that has great expectations He gets excited when we get it right. It's like a parent that when our kids get something, we are excited, we're their best cheerleaders. He wants what is best for us. He is always urging us onward and upward. Now church, that is a true picture of what Christian love really is. It is a selfless, sacrificial love that will do anything to make the object of that love better. And that's the way he loves us. And it's the way he calls us to love him and to love others. Motivated by love. Love is supreme. And love is the true measure of your Christian maturity. Look at verse 8. Paul says, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these is love. Love is the eternal standard for Christian growth. And by that standard, what he is saying in that passage to the Corinthians is that they were mere children. It would be like the preacher standing in the pulpit on Sunday morning and saying to a group of adults, you immature, spiritually weak, non-growing children. Not the best way to win friends and influence people. But it was true for the church at Corinth. The things they thought were important were not going to last. And what Paul is saying to him is this. He said, you are like children playing with toys. Now, the, the truth is we expect children to play with toys. We expect children to think and act like children, but we also expect children to grow up. And we expect grown-ups to think and act like grown-ups. That's what he's saying to them. So here's the thing. 
If they had been growing in Christ's likeness, they would have realized that those gifts that Paul mentions there, love never ends. He says, as for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. If, if they had been growing in their faith, they would have realized that those spiritual gifts that they were essentially fighting over within the body, they would have realized that those gifts were temporary and they were given for the good of the church in this world. All of the gifts are temporary. Even faith and hope are temporary. The only one that is permanent is love. Amen. You know why that is? Faith is our belief in something that we cannot see, that we cannot prove. You won't need faith in eternity. For the life that you live by faith now, you will live by sight then. Faith will not be necessary. Hope will not be necessary. We hope for the future. But at that point, the future is present. And so the only thing that God gives us that we use as his body right now, the only thing that God has given us that we will take with us into eternity is love. Amen. That's it. It's the only one. And if they had been growing in their faith, they would have understood that reality. The measure of our maturity is our ability to serve alongside imperfect people, to do the work of ministry, and to live in healthy relationship with each other. And that's love. And it takes doing all of those things. It takes being patient and kind. It takes being not arrogant and not irritable. It takes all of those things for us to be able to do those things together. Now, whenever I'm applying this passage to a married couple that is <clears throat> maybe trying to figure out the rough edges of living life together, one of the things that I will ask them to do is to read and meditate on these verses with a view toward how it directs their love for their spouse. And that's important because typically whenever marriages get in that kind of a position, it's not because the parties are trying to direct their love toward their spouse, they're trying to direct their spouse's love towards them, right? It's like, you're not loving me the way that you're supposed to love me, rather than I'm not loving you the way that I'm supposed to love you. So don't read it as a way for you want your spouse to love you. Read it instead as a recipe for the way you're supposed to love your spouse. Now, <clears throat> in applying this to the church, and that's, Paul was not writing this for married couples. It's good for married couples, but that's not who he's writing it for. And so every wedding that I've ever done where I've read 1 Corinthians 13, it's really out of place. It's not meant for marriages, although it applies. It's meant for fighting churches, <laughs> where it also applies. So when, it, when you apply it to the church, like Paul was doing, it's a matter of deciding, is the church here for you, or are you here for the church. Paul wrote it because their relationships were a mess. And there are a lot of churches today where the same thing could be said. In fact, there are two passages in the New Testament where Paul speaks about love and the church. As, and the church specifically as the body of Christ. Here, 1 Corinthians, and then in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, where Jesus makes an emphatic statement about the way that we ought to love one another. <clears throat> Ephesians 5, 21, Jesus said, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Amen. Healthy churches are made up of healthy church members. Loving churches are made up of loving church members. Three things I want you to take away this morning. First, biblical love is selfless. Too many of us think about love in the sense of wanting other people to love us, to make us happy, to meet our needs, but it's not about us, it's about others. True biblical love is selfless. Second, true biblical love is sacrificial. Just as Jesus loved us by giving himself up on a cross, paying the price for our sin, 
Our love for him and our love for one another is supposed to be sacrificial. What price are you willing to pay to love? What are you willing to give up in order to love? Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Are you willing to give up preferences? True biblical love is sacrificial. And then finally, true biblical love is submissive. The way Paul put it in 1 Corinthians 13, it does not insist on its own way. Now, church, think about this. If we could really master the ability to love selflessly and sacrificially and submissively, it would change our relationships. It would change relationships in our homes. It would change relationships among friends. It would change relationships in our churches. It would change our world. If we could just learn how to love. So, I said that this is going to be all about commitments. I will. So, will you be a loving church member? Now, before you just jump out there and answer the question, uh, let, let me just make a suggestion to you. That's not really a yes or no question. Because there are times when it's easy to love others. There are times when it takes an effort. In fact, I've got a friend, Melanie and I have a friend, that every time he sees us, he looks at me and he says, I love you because Jesus told me to. And he looks at Melanie and he says, and I love you. Some people are easy to love and others are a little bit harder. And so this is not really just a matter of willing it into being. It's not really a matter of just saying, I'm going to make this happen. I will be a loving church member. Last Sunday when I wasn't able to be here, (coughs) I was able to join online and worship with you, but I also had the privilege of joining another church where a friend of mine was preaching that morning. Uh, So I was able to get two sermons from two good preachers in the same Sunday. Some of you wish you could just get one. It was kind of a random idea for me to click on the other church's service, or at least I thought it was a random idea. In retrospect, I think the Holy Spirit was directing me there. Because my friend was preaching a different passage, but he was preaching on love. And so as soon as he started, I was like, oh, cool. I'm going to get some pointers for next week's message. And, And all the way toward the end, as he was beginning to make an application, I was like, this is why the Lord sent me here. And so what I'm about to share with you is based on what I heard him use as an illustration for application of how we can love one another, even when it's hard. Over the years, I've driven across the Coosa River on I-20 more times than I can count. So have many of you. When we lived in Talladega, we would often go over to some friends' house. They lived on the south end of the lake near the dam. And they lived right on the lake. They had pontoon boat and jet skis and all that. And we would go out and play on the water and just had a wonderful time. And, you know, in the summer when the lake is at its normal levels, that is one of the most beautiful places on all of the earth. But there are other times when the the lake is out of its banks. When we've had an awful lot of rain, especially upstream in the the hills and the mountains of northeast Alabama and and north Georgia, and they're they're making their way southward, and it, it all kind of pools up there, and the power company has to figure out how to release the water so they're not making the problem worse down the down the river. And, and, and there are times when that water level can get up, and there's some, in fact, there's an apartment complex there right off I 20. If you're going toward Atlanta, if you look to your left, I have seen the water where it was all the way covering everything but the building sticking up. So there are times when the, when the water gets out of its banks, it overflows. And then there are times, those times in the winter months. If you've ever driven across the I 20 bridge there at Riverside going into Lincoln, When the power company has dropped the levels to get ready for the springtime rains and and the, the 
I mean, it's ugly. It's like mud and stumps and washing machines that people threw away that they didn't think anybody was ever going to see. And you realize, man, when we've been out there on jet skis, we've been skiing over all this stuff. And all of that ugliness is just revealed. Well, our ability to be a loving church member is kind of like the water level on Lake Logan Martin. Think about that. There are times when our ability to love is like the lake at normal levels. It's just easy and it's pretty and it's, it's simple and it's like you don't even have to think about it. Everything is good. You're in a good place. Others are in a good place. And life is good and loving is easy. Is that a song? Life, life is good and loving is easy? Probably not one would want to sing in church if it is. Anyway, there are other times when things are going so well in life that our love is just overflowing. I mean, it's, it's out of the banks. And even those difficult people, we don't have a problem loving them because we're just so full that it just comes out of us. But then there are those times when our ability to love is at drought level. It's not necessarily the other person. It's that we are spent. We are emotionally on empty. And we don't have the capacity to be loving towards others. Maybe it's a time that we're in a spiritual desert place, but it's in those times that the ugly comes out. And it's just really, really hard. So what do we do when we're there? How do we get that loving feeling? How do we get ourselves to a point where we are able to love the unlovely, where we're able to love when we don't feel loving at all. We know what to do when our love is overflowing, but what do we do when we're at drought level? You can't just will it to happen. You can't. That would be my, like my friends on the lake. When the water level is low, the power company's got the... the spill gates open that'd be like them going up to their house getting their garden hose and going to throwing it in the river and turning on the spigot and trying to fill it back up it ain't going to work because the source is not adequate for the task and can i tell you that when you are spiritually on empty you can't will yourself to love because the source is inadequate for the task you and I are inadequate for the task. The only source that is adequate is Jesus. He is the only source that enables us to love the way that Paul described in 1 Corinthians 13. You can't do it. I can't do it. My grandmother couldn't have done it. It just can't happen. But Jesus can do it through us. You say, well, preacher, how, do, how does that happen? I want it to happen. How does it happen? Well, here's what Jesus said. Abide in me. Amen. Abide in me. Come to me. Bring me your spiritual drought. Bring me all of the ugly stuff that's showing up in your life. Come to me and I will give you myself. Abide in me, and my love will also abide in you. Will you be a loving church member? The only way for that to happen is for you to come to Jesus. Abide in him, and he will give you his love that will overflow into every area of your life. Join me as we pray. Father, God, thank you so much for loving us. God, thank you for loving me. I'm not always easy to love. But you have demonstrated your love toward me in this, that while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. Father, thank you for loving us in that way. And God, I pray right now that as your people, as Huffman Baptist Church, 
Father, that we would make the commitment today. I will love. And God, we know the only way that happens is for us to run to Jesus and abide in Him. Father, bind us together.